Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Becca, if we have never met before, and this is my channel where I talk about all the houseplant things. Today we are doing a continuation of my mini series, Advice From dot dot dot. <laughs> I have done a video previously where I read through an old gardening book from 1951. There was a section on houseplants, so that's what we went through last time. And today I have something that is very, very exciting. So I saw someone on Instagram who was selling these old like vintage plant books and I thought that they were so cool and so beautiful. A big part of the reason why I really love vintage plant books and all of these things is the covers and the photos on the inside. They really are just so beautiful. Like honestly, works of art. Someone actually told me that the first time a lot of these books were printed, the photos were in black and white, but later on, women actually went back through and like colored in all of the photos to make them colorized. So I thought that was very interesting. The book that we're going to be looking at today is Foliage Houseplants. If you are interested in seeing a video on these other topics. We have perennials, flowering houseplants, and cactus and succulents. So I feel like any of those would be really entertaining. So let me know which one you want to see first, if any of them, and I would love to do another one of these videos on this book series. So I guess just like the previous book, we first opened it up and we looked at the date that the book was published. This is the Time Life Encyclopedia of Gardening. Uh, foliage house plants by James Underwood Crockett and the editors of Time Life Books. And actually, in a video that I filmed earlier today when I was talking about green thumbs, as you probably have already seen, James Underwood Crockett actually talked about where the green thumb myth actually came from. So that's interesting to see his name again today. This book was published in 1972. I just realized my nail polish looks really bad. Okay, I'm back. I removed my nail polish actually because I couldn't stand the thought of editing this video where my nails looked like that. <laughs> okay, so a world of greenery at home. Okay, the advantages of tender loving care. Oh my gosh, I love that. Love that. Um, helping your plants multiply and then an encyclopedia of foliage houseplants. I would be interested to know which ones they added in here and how many of them we still have around that are super popular now because Obviously houseplants, it's not a new thing for them to be in style, but there are definitely plants that are more in style now than they were then. <gasps> oh, look at her! A queen. <laughs> I see some Norfolk pine. That's a begonia. That looks like maidenhair fern. I don't know what that is. Oh, that looks like orchid roots. Yeah, there's an orchid up there. Oh my goodness. Okay, on a visit to New York City not long ago, I discovered that one of its most fashionable new stores is not a chic boutique on Fifth Avenue, but a full-size working greenhouse built on top of a four-story loft building near the East River. I feel like that's how New York is now. Anyone who lives in New York, let me know. I feel like New York is like one of the epicenters of the houseplant world, probably because it's New York. It's like a concrete jungle. Oh my gosh, I wanna read this whole thing, but because we're going through this for a video, I'm going to hold on to that. In this dazzling array of foliage, there was something to suit practically every taste and pocketbook. <laughs> I love that. Only a few years ago, such a rooftop rainforest could have never existed, nor could all the other new plant stores that I have noticed in the city. What has brought them into being is the unprecedented boom in the popularity of houseplants, particularly those prized for their foliage rather than flowers, not only in apartments and houses, but in offices, banks, and stores. This feels like it was written today. You know, this is so relevant to right now. More and more people apparently have realized that plants make the long hours spent confined indoors a little more pleasant. They are not only healthy, but pretty things to have around. Oh my gosh. What a beautiful summation of why people have plants. And that is just as relevant in 1970 as it is today. I think that is really, really beautiful. Right here, it talks a little bit about like the origin of houseplants, which I think is really interesting. I hope I'm not doing too much reading to you, but I think this is so interesting. And like, even if you weren't here, I would be reading this. So I'm going to keep reading because yeah. <laughs> a struggling specimen that was left behind the apartment's previous inhabitant and nursed back to health by its new owner was a Hartley philodendron, the most widely grown foliage houseplant in America today, and in fact, the plant that can be said to have started today's boom in indoor gardening. Okay, raise your hand if you have a Hartley philodendron at home. I do. <laughs> 
That's so amazing. This appealing little vine known to botanists as philodendron oxycardium, which is not what it's known as now. It's now known as philodendron cordatum, was first brought from the West Indies to England in 1793 by Captain William Bly, along with several hundreds of other species of varying interest to the Royal Botanical Gardens. Its great popularity as a houseplant did not begin until 1936 when John Masick, a nurseryman in Orlando, Florida, rediscovered it. Florida. There you go. <laughs> okay, so it came from the West Indies to England and what is the West Indies I've heard this so many times okay so after I finished filming this video and in the editing process I've looked more into the term West Indies because I have heard this before specifically in school when we were learning about colonialism and Christopher Columbus and as I was researching more that is the name that Christopher Columbus gave the Caribbean region but modern day People don't use West Indies. Obviously this book was written in 1972, so that is why it is used, but now people say Caribbean. It went from the, the Caribbean area to England and then it pops up in Orlando, Florida. Okay, so this plant gained popularity because it was really easy to propagate. It was relatively pest free, so it was pretty resistant to pests. Pots of philodendron appeared everywhere and before long a sizable houseplant industry was born. Today, in 1972, Florida produces close to $50 million worth of foliage plants a year, over 60% of the total U.S. output, and two-thirds of Florida's 117 commercial growers are now clustered in the Orlando area. Oh my gosh. So I can't even imagine what that is now because Florida is still a huge, huge part of the plant industry in America. Popularity has also spurred for the search of other more exotic plants of every type. So basically what we're getting here is after the booming popularity of the Hartley philodendron, there was more of a need for other types of plants. And a lot of these plants were discovered growing wild in the tropical and semi-tropical regions of South America, Africa, Asia, and Australia. Okay, there's a lot to unpack here. <laughs> I could like hang out on this page forever. Like that is so cool. Um, okay, but we are gonna move on. So we have here a diagram on how to make a moss pole actually. So moss poles are are not a unique thing. <laughs> it's been around forever. That's so interesting. Wow, wow, wow. Okay, so this is about plants in water. Many plants grow not only in soil that is well watered, but in water alone. Okay. Ooh, look at that. Okay. So this is a Dracaena Draco, seen from above. That's super fun. I love this, I love this. <gasps> oh, the photos in this book are so beautiful. This is such a beautiful spread. Like, just look at this. I love the dark background with the plants. I mean, you would think that it would make them blend in a lot, but I really like the way that it looks. Very cool, so we have some ficus. A uh, fern up here and then a palm. Oh, this is so cool too! Oh, Philodendron Selum, we love her. Oh my gosh, so many, so many familiar and so many unfamiliar. Oh, here we go. Look at this Peperomia. Mm, okay, what to look for when you're shopping for a plant. So when you're shopping for a plant, there are several ways you can tell whether a particular specimen is sound. First, look at the leaves. They should be approximately the size and color specified for their species in the encyclopedia section. Okay, so they've given you like parameters of what makes a healthy plant or what you should buy. They should exhibit no browning of the edges, a symptom of too much fertilizer or too much heat, and the lower leaves should show no indication of becoming pale or yellow, a sign of improper watering. Look critically at the intervals between the leaves and the stems. Um, new leaves will not grow to fill in the gaps, so unless the foliage is reasonably dense, reject the plant. <laughs> reject it. Say no. <laughs> When inspecting the leaves, you should also look closely for evidence of insects at the tip of new branches and the places where the leaves join the stems. Oh, this is so cool! So we have aphids, white fly, spider mite, scale, and mealybugs. There is not thrips here, but it tells you the description, what they look like, and oh, and plants that are most susceptible to them. And then it tells you just how to like fix them up. That's really great. I love that. Okay, look at that. A garden in a climate of its own. Okay, so this is like terrariums. Very fun. I think I saw a pretty cool photo of a terrarium. 
Oh, it tells you how to make one. There it is. Look at her. She's so proud of her terrarium. <laughs> What is this? 1975. A calendar from 1975. Okay. I'm gonna leave that in there. A summer outside. Let's talk about that because I feel like that would be related to bringing plants outside for the summer. Okay, plants as well as people seem to like vacations after a long winter. They often benefit from a summer on the porch or terrace. Yes, this is so true, and I love that they call it a summer vacation. That's so fun. <laughs> if you move your plants outside, however, you would be wise to follow a few basic rules. First, do not move them out until all danger of a late spring frost has passed. Secondly, when the safe weather does arrive, put them in deep shade for a week or more. Yes. The reason for this precaution is because their foliage is tender because it developed under weak indoor light and can be easily burned by the much higher light levels outdoors. Very true. Very true. Very good advice. We have a little diagram on repotting large house plants. This is very interesting. I have done this method before. You just like shove something down in there to like loosen up the soil around the pot. Foliage to brighten inside walls. Oh, so this tells you like design. Like how to design your plants. Oh, I love it. That's so cute. <laughs> oh my goodness. So first we have them like hanging above the couch and then we have them inside of the fireplace. That's a really great idea when you're not using the fireplace. And then around the bookshelves. Very nice. Oh my gosh, look at that. It looks like some of our living rooms. I love this couch. That's amazing. Oh, and look at that chair. Oh, look at that, we have air layering. So we're on to helping your plants multiply. So this is probably propagating and stuff like that. So this is air layering. That's basically when you wrap the roots in moss and plastic wrap so that the plant will grow new roots without you cutting it away yet. And then once it grows roots, you can cut it away. So this is propagation by division. Stem cuttings, oh look at this. That's a bag propagation that it's suggesting. From leaf sections, ooh. Oh yeah, okay, this is Sansevieria. So to produce many plants from a single Sansevieria leaf, cut the leaf into three to four lengths and press the base of each stem filled into a flat filled with moist sand, perlite, or vermiculite. So none of this is suggesting water propagation, which I think is very interesting. Okay, so now we are on to the encyclopedia of plants, the very last section I wanted to go over today. And this drawing is beautiful. I wanna like frame it. <laughs> Just pull it out and put it in a frame. It's so beautiful. There's so many lovelies in here. Lots of really great stuff in here. I hope that you guys enjoyed looking through this plant book with me. I definitely really enjoyed looking through this one and I already know that I'm gonna go back and read so much of this because I truly, truly enjoy reading about houseplants and just seeing people's perspectives and what they have to say and I just still cannot get over how similar the description of New York was then to now. Do let me know which one of these next books you want to see. I am very interested to do all of them. <laughs> I do have another plant book not from this series that I will be doing next and I'm really excited to look into that one. That one was actually sent to me by a subscriber, so thank you for that. So if you enjoyed this video, make sure that you hit the like button so I know, and comment down below your favorite thing that you saw in this book today, and what else do I have to say? My goodness, there's just so much to say. If you're not already, make sure that you subscribe to my channel to check out more of my plant content, and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.